uh, because of the steadfast love of God that's ours in Christ, we're gonna rest in him and we're gonna exalt his name. So Carly's gonna lead us as we read. Let's stand. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth.
sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. What is our hope? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our day within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood. Who holds our faith when fears arise? Who stands above the stormy trial? Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing. Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ he lives, Christ he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Amen. Well, we want to take uh, a moment today to confess together some things that we believe and some of the reason that we can sing about a hope like that. So let's uh, join our voices. Let's confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah.
Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning. Father, you are so worthy to be worshipped. And we love you for dying through Christ on the cross for our sins. And Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. We come to you this morning with great needs in our lives. And we come to you this morning with confidence, Father, that you, through Christ, can provide all that we need. And God, we come to you in the precious name of Christ and knowing that he loves us so much that he died for us. And although by rights we should have been destroyed, you freely granted us forgiveness, life, and the bliss of heaven to come. And we thank you for that. We thank you for loving us so much that you rescued us from sin, death, and hell. And Father, we confess that we do not do your will. We struggle with sin. We struggle with self. Through Christ, you have modeled to us how to live, and through the Holy Spirit, you've given us the power to rise above our flesh. But Father, we still sin and fail in so many different ways. Please forgive us, and we thank you for the great promise of John, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And although our sins are many, your mercy is more, and we thank you for that. Father, we pray for our hearts this morning that we would be Christ-like, even in the worst of circumstances. Help us to have our hope in a God who is sovereign over all things. And Father, although... Many times we don't understand what you are doing. Help us to trust you, that you love us, and you provide what's best for us. And God, that we pray for our community. We we pray for our local state uh, officials and even in Clay County, that you would just give great wisdom and discernment and leadership. We thank you for your sovereign hand over all things, and we pray that you would work in our hearts to whenever we have the opportunity to do good to everyone, and especially for those who are in the family of God. Father, we pray for your church, Community Bible Church of Orange Park, and we pray that we would grow in the gospel and go with the gospel. And we pray Psalm 133.1 says, How good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we pray that you'd help us to be a unified church. Help us to fulfill our responsibilities as members of the body here. We thank you for all those who serve. We pray that you would just bless them and help them with strength, as many times it's tough. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters this morning who are trusting in you in very challenging times in their lives. And we know you have the power to overcome sickness and shame and even death and help us to trust you more. Help us to trust you when you allow in our lives circumstances that we don't understand. And we pray you would work in our midst in a supernatural way this morning. And Father, we also pray for all who are worshiping you today, lifting your name high all over the world, in our state, and in our community, Father. And we come to you this morning praying for Harvest Bible Church in Jacksonville and Brett Morganini. And we join with that body of believers with the desire to love the Lord, love one another, show and share Jesus. And Father, we thank you that the work of Christ is applied to us effectively and continually. And we know that we are secure in the forgiveness of Christ, one for us at Calvary. And our prayer this morning is for you to be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And Father, as we Head into your word this morning. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts in a great way. We pray for Matt as he opens your word and through your Holy Spirit. Would you speak to him today and speak to our hearts and help us to become more like Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I forgot to say, have a seat. How was that? We're glad everybody's here this morning. If, if you're a first-time guest, we're especially glad you're here, and we would ask of one thing of you, and that's to take the connection card. You should see one in front of you. Fill that out and get it to our connection desk in the back. 
Uh, we've actually got a gift for you, even if you don't fill out that card. So make sure you touch by the, uh, stop by the connection desk. And we'd also like to invite you to something we call What's Next. And it's on the last Sunday of the month, which is next week. And after both services, just a few minutes to talk to you and help to get you to understand and get more information about our church so you have some ways to connect with us more. May the Lord bless you as we continue. Let's go to uh, Genesis this morning, Genesis chapter 1, and uh, as we say each week, there are Bibles that are in chair racks in front of you. If you don't have a Bible and you would like to follow along with us this morning, you can go to Genesis chapter 1 there, and uh, this is super easy to find. It's the beginning, so flip through the introduction and all that stuff and get to Genesis 1, and that's, that's where we're going to be uh, spending uh, some of our time today. If you don't own a Bible and you want to take that one home, by all means do so. Uh, we want everybody to have a copy of God's Word. The universe is an amazing place. I'm going to put up a picture on the screen behind me. Uh, this is a picture uh, that NASA stitched together. It's a composite image that NASA has made. But you can see on that picture all these tiny little points uh, of light. And these tiny little points of light are all kinds of different colors that you can probably see if you were looking at it on your phone or on your computer screen. It'd probably be uh, even, even better for you. But all of these Tiny points of light are not stars. Every one of these points of light on this composite image that NASA put together is a galaxy. And NASA, I did not verify this to, uh, to be sure, so you're going to have to forgive me for this. But NASA says that there are 15,000 galaxies in that picture. Now you know why I didn't count. I kind of give it a once over to see if they, it looked to, looked to be about 15,000. <laughs> but that ought to put into perspective how vast, how unexplored the universe really is. I mean, I've I have gone down to the Kennedy Space Center a couple hours south of here, as many of you have probably done before, and you can see the magnificent, heroic efforts that, that, that men and women, brilliant men and women, have, have gone to to be able to put a person on the moon. And you think about, in, in the grand scope of human history, how long it took us to put somebody on the moon and we got there. Somebody actually stepped on it. That's incredible. Not only that, but we have sent a tiny little golf cart to Mars. <laughs> and that tiny little golf cart can take pictures and it can do soil samples, and it can pick up rocks, and it doesn't seem like there's really much going on there but rocks. <laughs> so I was excited at the first, I started following it on Twitter, and I was like, cool, cool, cool. And then after a week, I was like, is this all that's on Mars? <laughs> but think about it. It's amazing that we could put a device that takes years to get to another planet. We can put something on there and it will it'll email pictures back to us. That's incredible. But you think of all the, the billions of dollars that have gone into that. You think of how long it has taken humanity to even get to that point. How much technology has built on that and built on that and built on that. And then you look at that image on the screen behind me and it's like, what have we actually done? There are 15,000 galaxies, whole systems, that we don't have the slightest idea what's going on in those galaxies or what they look like. It's, it's incredible. So when we look at that stuff, we might rightfully ask the question, how in the world did that stuff come to be? Why is there something 
rather than nothing? This is a question that human beings have considered for the ages. Aristotle wrestled with this question some two and a half millennia ago. As Aristotle was examining the universe, he was noticing that, that, that every motion is caused by another motion. And so he started examining this domino effect of motion that causes motion that causes motion. And he started looking at the fact that behind every single motion, there's always another motion to, dis- to discover. And, and he s- began asking the question, well, well, well how did this start? And that's when he proposed a phrase that many of you probably learned in school at some point. He proposed the idea of the unmoved mover. The unmoved mover is the one who, in effect, tips the dominoes in the first place. The the originating motion that sets off motion after motion after motion, but is not, in and of itself, moved. Then... In 1981, Stephen Hawking rocked the world by proposing a model that suggested that the entire universe could have originated from nothing. This proposal challenged every known view of the cosmos, whether you are an atheist or a theist. Most everyone has believed in the idea of a first cause, whether it is theism of some sort or whether it is non-theism where somehow matter and energy came together to, to create all that is. But Hawking suggested that speaking of what happened before the Big Bang was as meaningless as, what, as asking what lies south of the South Pole. He proposed a model of the universe, mathematically speaking, that is shaped like, and I kid you not, a badminton birdie. I was reading the article and I was thinking, this is, this is fascinating, I'm going to figure this out. And then the more I read, the more I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to figure this out. That guy was thinking on... Not just a level ahead of me, like 10,000 levels beyond what I am capable of doing. And so I did what I always do and I think, I'm going to figure this out. And then I start figuring it out. I'm like, oh, I can't. I don't understand any of this. It's another, it's another language. But what Hawking was proposing was a, a mathematical model for which there was no beginning. For Hawking, there was no singularity. There is no starting point of everything that is beyond the reach of our physical laws. Brilliant minds. And there's no mistaking the brilliance of Aristotle, and there's no mistaking the brilliance of people like Stephen Hawking. Brilliant minds have wrestled to identify the beginning, or if we can even talk about something in terms of a beginning. But the opening verses of Genesis make their own proposal, an answer to the question of why is there something rather than nothing. If you're there with me in Genesis chapter 1, look at the first two verses, which will be the only verses that we look at today. Genesis 1, 1 and 2, let's read them together. The Bible says this, beginning in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering Over the face of the waters. These verses make a proposal that continues to rock the world today. That proposal is this simply the universe is a created thing. Regardless of what you think about how that happened, the universe is a created thing. Now, let's immediately note that while this proposal is scandalous to many people today in our modern culture, this would have been a bit of a yawn statement for the original readers. 
The particulars would have been challenged, but the idea of the world being a created thing would have been something that everyone simply assumed and was almost universally accepted. The assumptions and the presuppositions of people in our day, in many cultures, but I would say not all, but in many cultures, our assumptions have changed. Today, our assumptions is that, one of our assumptions is that matter and energy is all that is. Another assumption is that science has the capability of explaining everything that is. That if we don't have the answer to something, science can, if we put our minds to it enough, eventually provide an answer. And that there, there is a materialistic and naturalistic explanation for everything. I would suggest that that in itself is a faith claim. But let me be clear, the Bible is in no way anti-science. We may disagree with Stephen Hawking about origins or lack of origins, but the mathematical model of the universe may well be shaped like a badminton birdie. Who am I to say? As Christians who believe that we live in an ordered world created by God himself, we have every reason to be as pro-science as one can be. But the Bible doesn't answer all of our science questions. It does, however, in the verses that we've just read, provide a definitive answer about the origin of the universe, that it is a created thing. I want to ask and answer, then, three questions about this universe that is a created thing Three very simple questions that are rooted in our text today. The first one is simply, when? There are all kinds of ideas about when exactly the universe was created, when exactly the universe came into being, and there are all sorts of ways at arriving of an answer for that, and I don't want to brag, but I want to help you this morning by providing for you a definitive answer to that question. My definitive answer to question is found in the text and is easy to overlook. But I'd like you to look at verse 1. When did it start? In the beginning. There you go. And by the way, you're welcome. Genesis, that, that answer may not be satisfactory to you, but Genesis assumes that in the beginning is good enough. Maria in The Sound of Music says, let's start at the very beginning because that is a very good place to start. And if we get too hung up on answering that particular question, though that question is worthy of being explored and proposals are worth being made, if we get hung up too much on answering that question, we miss the chance to step back and marvel at what we have just read. Most of you, regardless of your age, have watched a YouTube video at some point in your life. And what do we often do when we're done watching a YouTube video? We share that YouTube video. Because that cat is too cute to not send to your sister. One of the things that YouTube allows you to do if you send a, a video is you can actually create a, a, a link for that person that starts in the middle of the video where you want them to start watching it to cut off the beginning of it. You can start it at a timestamp. As we study history, we can go back as if the, the history of, of, of all that is, as if it was a giant YouTube video, we can grab that little red circle on that YouTube video and we can slide our way up and down the timeline. But Genesis grabs that red circle on that timeline and it zooms all the way back 
to the very beginning, even before the ads that you can't wait five seconds to skip, that your, your finger is ready to go so I don't have to hear one extra second of that advertisement. All the way to 0.0, all the way to the black screen at the beginning. That's when the clock started. And you and I have existed in a succession of moments ever since. We are fascinated with stories about time, aren't we? We're fascinated with books and films that that talk about the idea of manipulating time, bending time, going backward in time, forward in time, multiverses in which there are multiple timelines happening at the same time. There's all kinds of things that we're interested in like that. When I was a little kid, there was was an animated movie called The Land Before Time. That was a really long time ago. There's books like A Wrinkle in Time. There's movies like Back to the Future, which explore what happens when you start tinkering with time and it messes up the future. There's people like Doctor Strange. And if you're super nerdy, Doctor Who. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) There's movies like Interstellar. Okay, you, you just start thinking about all the stories that we have about time and our, our fascination with being able to rise above time, to be able to, to manipulate time, to slow it down or to speed it up, to, to bend it to our will and to our purposes. We're fascinated by those things. But it's very difficult for us to imagine existence without time entirely. What would it be like to exist outside of time? We don't have words that can describe existence outside of time. We have beginnings and endings and words like when things started and words like when, which is an indication of time. Yet Genesis drags the cursor to 0.0. And then implies that there was a time before that, which actually isn't a time, but I don't know how to describe what has, what's before time. It's whatever that is, that's what it is. That's the brilliance you're going to get from me this morning. It introduces us actually to the inventor of time itself. And that leads us to the second question that these verses answer, and it is, the who. The very next word which follows this, this tantalizing phrase in the beginning, the very next word that, that follows that phrase is the word God. The story starts with God. In fact, the entirety of the biblical story is a story that is first and foremost about God. That doesn't mean that the story is not about us. It does not mean that we are simply an afterthought to the story. What it does tell us is that our story fits into that one. Your story, my story, all of our stories are explainable in the one story that begins and ends with God. God is the one who begins the timeline. God is Aristotle's unmoved mover. God is not only the finger that tips the first domino that causes them all to fall in succession, but he is the one who makes the dominoes and stands the dominoes up. God is what lies south of the South Pole, to use Hawking's analogy. Now, there are several implications here in this verse that are in seed form that are developed throughout the Bible. And we could spend a lot of time talking about these implications. But I just want to highlight a few of them for you this morning. Three of them, in fact. First of all, this ver- these verses highlight the aseity of God. The aseity of God. How many people here 
Is that a new word for? Okay, good. We've got lots of, lots of people who are not afraid to encounter something new and admit it. <laughs> I encounter new things all the time. That's a new phrase for us. It's for many of us. It's not a term we use often, but it's from a, a, a Latin term, which means from the self. And I'll give you a definition that's provided by a theologian by the name of John Frame. John Frame defines God's aseity this way. God's aseity means that he is sufficient to himself, independent of anything outside himself. God's eternality is his aseity with respect to time. Lord of time, existing above and apart from it, but free to enter into it to accomplish his purposes. If I could take that definition that Frame has very helpfully given us and just pull two words out of it that would kind of summarize the concept of a whole as, as a whole, it would be the words independent and sufficient. God is independent and he is sufficient. The doctrine of God's aseity means that God does not need. And you don't have to fill in the blank after that with anything. You can actually end the statement right there. God does not need. Now I want you to think about that in contrast to your own self. And I want you to think about how much you need. You need your heart to keep firing. You need oxygen and a fair amount of it. You need food. You need sleep. There are so many things that you and I need, not want. Our life is, our, our continuing life is connected <laughs> to so many of those things that if even one of those little things is lost, the whole thing falls apart. We are needy creatures. We are fragile creatures. And then consider the fact that God doesn't need anything. He is totally independent in and of himself. He is totally sufficient in and of himself. And there's this place in the Bible where the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 stands up in the, the Greek city of Athens in a place called the Areopagus. And it's a place where philosophical ideas, theological concepts, it, it's, it's a marketplace of ideas where, where things are exchanged. And there are, there are altars and inscriptions all around the Areopagus that are monuments to various deities. And they eat, they've got all their bases covered. They They've even got a, a monument to the un unknown God, which was like the catch-all monument. If there's any God that happens to show up and realizes he or she does not have anything, we got you right there. And Paul uses that as a jumping off point to preach about the one true God to those people. And do you know of all the doctrines that the Apostle Paul could have chosen to lead with in his explanation of God, he chooses to lead with God's aseity. In Acts 17 verses 24 and 25, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. When God creates, he does not create from a sense of need. Think about every invention that we have ever come up with. Every invention that we have made as human beings was, was springing from either need or want. 
I don't like walking around vacuuming, somebody said one day. You gotta plug it in or you gotta charge it, you gotta empty it. It's it's a pain. So behold, the Roomba. <laughs> now I don't have to do any of that stuff. Roomba will do it for me. Now we're laughing about that, but it illustrates for you, I hope, the fact that we we create, we invent out of a sense of either want or need. God was not looking around saying, I have some sort of need that needs to be met or want that I want to fulfill and therefore I will create. God did not create because he was lonely in some way and he needed companionship. He is the eternal, self-existent God who needs nothing yet provides everything. The Apostle Paul says by virtue of his creating and providing, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is in charge. He is the authority that is God's aseity. We also see here in seed form the eternality of God in the second place. If God already existed prior to the black screen in the beginning, then that means, of course, that God exists outside of the timeline. Once again, frame helps us when he says this, God's eternality is his aseity with respect to time and therefore his lordship over time. Because he is the creator of time, he stands above it, but enters it freely to do his will. He transcends time in that, number one, he has no beginning or end. Number two, he does not change. Number three, He is equally conscious of past, present, and future. And four, he is not limited by the passing of time in what he can accomplish. Remember what I said? Don't let's not, in our familiarity or our attempt to to solve or understand other questions, let's not miss the opportunity to marvel what God is like. It's difficult for us to even find the terminology to explain God's existence, how a being can exist eternally outside of time. That leads us to the third attribute of God that's found here in seed form, and of course there's many more, but it leads us to see in the third place the power of God. That God needs nothing and no one that he has always been and that he creates the heavens and the earth in a showcase of his power. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12 says this. It says, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. No wonder Isaac Watts could write four or 500 years ago, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves in what we're going to be talking about next week. And so I want us to ask that third question of our text. We've asked when, we've asked Who? The third question is, what? The Bible tells us in the second half of verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth is a literary device that's often known as a mirrorism. A mirrorism is a, uh, uh, a, a rhetorical vice, device that describes two things often two poles, and uses those two poles or those things to stand for the whole. So the heavens and the earth is simply a way of Genesis saying, in the beginning, God created everything. 
There's nothing, there's nothing outside the category, if you were going to write it down, if there's nothing outside the category of everything that exists that isn't because of God. But the second verse tells us something a bit odd and perplexing. And I think sometimes in our reading of Genesis, particularly because of our, many of our familiarity with this story, we jump straight from verse 1 to verse 3. But verse 2 is there. And the Bible tells us what God creates. It gives us a little bit more information when it explains the heavens and the earth. Because in verse 2, the Bible says, The earth was without form and void. And when he uses that term void, we're not talking about something that has been voided, a transaction that's been voided or canceled. We're using the term, and the Bible uses, is using the term void in the sense of empty. That place is a void. We might refer to some empty gym or something like that. It's, it's a place that's empty. And this is a Hebrew phrase that's used a few different times in the Old Testament to describe a wilderness, a desert, a wasteland, if you will. It's a phrase that refers to a place of emptiness. It's a phrase that's used to describe a place that is generally uninhabitable, a place where life is not necessarily going to flourish. If you were to pick your next vacation a uh, 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 place based on postcards and you're flipping through all the options and you come to this one which is without form and void and what we'll see darkness you're probably going to keep going it's not a place where you're going to want to spend your time it's a place that is without form it is a place that is unfilled and it is a place that is blanketed in darkness so Darkness is the absence of light. We have here, strangely, a description of a place where things are not necessarily going to flourish. Formless and void doesn't mean evil. It means empty. But the final phrase of verse 2 awakens in us the potential of that is there. Because it makes this interesting statement in the the final sentence of verse 2. The Bible says, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? I I got a lot of questions about this. A lot of questions about this. The Hebrew word for spirit is the same Hebrew word for wind or breath. So the spirit of God, the breath of God is here over the face of the waters. And when we use the phrase, that person is breathing down my neck, what do we mean by that? We We often use it to talk about our boss. The boss is breathing down my neck. We Often talk about it to refer to our spouse who's acting like a boss, uh, not in the good way. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll keep it in the, the employer realm of things. But when, when somebody's breathing down your neck, they're so close, you can feel them. And the imagery here is the Spirit of God, the breath of God, breathing down creation's neck. The Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. You imagine this this darkness, liquidy darkness. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God is there, hovering. So many questions. This word hovering is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible to describe the activity of an eagle. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 11, the Bible says, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters, there's our word, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. So there's, there's something mysterious that the Bible just, I think, teases us with. It invites us to imagine the situation that's there when God initially creates the heavens and the earth. I'm going to come back to that question in just a few moments, or to those ideas in just a few moments. But I want to end our time together exploring these two verses by talking to a, a couple of different groups of people that might be here with us this morning. First of all, uh, there are always people with us, Lord willing, who aren't Christians. And there are often people who are skeptics. And we just want you to know that we are always glad that you're here. Can I urge you to keep exploring this, even though your skeptic meter might be on full blast right now? There are things between faith and science that we don't yet know how to harmonize. And I'm not a sciencey guy. So those of you who are the sciencey people that want me to like solve all that stuff for you, you're at the wrong church. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> But there's lots of great books out there. But let me suggest a starting point for you if you find yourself in the skeptical category, maybe even about the existence of God. One of the things that's interesting to me about these first two verses of Genesis chapter 1 is that, is that the author makes no attempt whatsoever to prove God's existence. It just starts right in. In the beginning, God, there he is. Now, for the original readers, that wouldn't have been much of a thing that was necessary to do. After all, your people that are getting led through the wilderness by a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day, you don't need a lot of convincing. And someone might be here saying, Sure be nice if one night on the way home from work, pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire could take me home. I'd believe them. But the Bible tells us that by virtue of God's creatorship, there is plenty of information available about him, even though it may not come in the form of a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire at night. There's verses in Romans chapter 1 that I want to read to you, verses 19 and 20. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 say this, For what can be known about God is plain to them. You could say plain to us. It's just referring to human beings. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. What those verses are telling us is that there is this thing built into every one of us that recognizes, has the ability to recognize that when we look up and out, when we see 15,000 galaxies or 15,000 ants in a pile in our front lawn, that God exists. And that doesn't solve all the questions, and that doesn't answer everything. But the Bible actually says that all human beings, based on that knowledge alone, are without excuse. Because his attributes are clearly perceivable in what has been made. Romans goes on to tell us that the God who is there sent his son into the timeline. That's what John Frame told us, remember? 
God's aseity, his independence, allows him to exist outside the timeline but work within the timeline. And the Bible actually tells us that, that, that Jesus Christ is the agent of creation. In fact, John 1 says, without him, referring to Jesus, was not anything made that was made. Something has gone, spoiler alert, drastically wrong. And Romans begins by saying, the God who we all know is there has sent his son into the timeline to rescue us from the destruction of sin by giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross and then rising in power over death itself. Complete control of the timeline. You may not be there yet, but what I am asking you to do is to respond to whatever that thing is that's in here, whatever that spark that says that's true or I don't want that to be true, I'm afraid to believe that's true, whatever that thing is, don't try to put that thing out. Explore this with us. Explore honestly what the Bible has to say. Let me speak to those of us who are Christians. Let me go back to where we were at, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, the the end of verse 2 invites us to ask a question. What is God going to do with this? What's God, what's God going to do with this? Formless and empty and dark. What's God going to do? And if God is the ase, eternal, powerful creator, what can't he do? That's the kind of question that people are going to ask, God's people are going to ask throughout the storyline of the Bible. What is going with God going to do now? And based on who he is, what can't he do? In fact, it's a question that we ought to ask in our own lives. The Bible uses an interesting analogy to describe salvation for us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. To use another analogy that the Bible gives us in the book of Romans, God is a potter. And we're clay. And you look at that forming process and you say, what is God going to do with this? And the person who trusts God and sees how he's revealed himself says, I don't know. But what can't he do? As we'll see next week, God is going to make this formless, empty, dark place Sing. And he does that with all of his creations. Genesis is a book about God's intent to bless. And that means, friends, that God is deserving of our worship, is he not? Romans 11 tells us this in verse 36. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. Everything was made by him. Everything was made for him. And everything is sustained through him. And that's why he deserves the glory forever. 
thank God, that intent to bless, that thread of everything for God's glory, as Pastor Joseph mentioned to us earlier and was in the worship God last night, that is intertwined with our good. So let's pray, and let's sing, and let's give him the glory he deserves. Lord, we just want to step back and worship as we consider the God who is there. As we consider a, an independent, sufficient, eternal, powerful creator God. And we thank you that all of us who are in Christ and who have put our faith in Christ are new creations that you are molding and shaping for your glory and our good. If there's somebody here this morning who's a skeptic, or people here with real questions, we pray that you would help them to look out and up, that they would sense that spark inside of them that responds to that, and I pray that you would lead them to a faith in that God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond. Let's stand. Let's worship. All creatures of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burn your sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer green Oh, praise Him Oh, praise Him Alleluia Alleluia, Alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. Praise the Son and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him! Oh, praise Him! Alleluia! 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 All the Washed by His blood, come and rejoice in His great love. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia! Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on Him. Oh, praise Him. Turn in power to reign. Heaven and earth shall join to say, Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Let shall fall on bended knee. All creatures of our God and King. Oh, praise Of 
God and King. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Amen. We praise Him. Amen. When we respond with our songs, we respond as well to the good news of who our God is and what he's done by giving. Um, that's one of the ways that we get to participate in the mission of God that he wants to accomplish through his people. Um, and so, uh, so we've got a couple ways that we can do that as a church family. We can give electronically. You can follow that link that's up on the screen. We've also got a, a box, a giving box on the back door that you'll pass on your way out. You can drop a check in there. But we are uh, so thankful, as always, for the faithful giving of God's people. And if you're a guest with us, we want you to know that we're not asking you for your money. We are just glad that you're here. This is uh, an opportunity and a privilege that we have as the people of God covenant together as members of this church to uh, work together for the mission that Jesus calls us to. And then as we leave, I want to uh, tell you guys about a couple of other ways that we can be together on mission. Um, the first one is actually through an exploring membership class that we're going to host uh, later this month. It'll meet on two Sundays, February 20th, and then again on March 6th for about an hour and a half here at the church in the evening. Um, this is an opportunity for you if you are new to Community Bible Church and you are uh, considering joining, want to know what it would mean to join our church as a member, um, we'd love to have you at this class. And uh, this is kind of a, a casual, um, I don't know, I call it like a guided conversation because like there's a lot of stuff I got to tell you about, but um, we have a lot of space to have questions and conversations. We want to introduce you a little more fully to our church, help you to know who we are and what we're about um, so that you can know whether or not this is a place that the Lord might be calling you to to join and covenant together with us for the sake of the mission that we're talking about. Um, so if you're new and you're curious about uh, CBC, curious about membership, we'd love to have you at this class. You're not going to be obligated to join because you attend, um, but it is an important step if you want to join our church uh, to attend the class for these two Sunday nights. Um, so if you have questions or if you want to get registered for that, would you just stop by the connection desk on your way out? It helps us to know who's coming so we can have some materials and things prepared for you guys, but we'd love to have you on uh, February 20th. And then we also have a uh, prayer list that goes out weekly to our church. And we want to keep this in front of you guys so that you can be um, actively participating in the important part of church community that is praying for one another. So every Tuesday, we send an email with, uh, with announcements and events and happenings around the church. And at the bottom of that is a link to a prayer list, as well as like a, just kind of an open request to send any uh, prayer needs that you have or updates on prayer needs, praises, things that God is doing way that he's working. Um, so I hope that you guys uh, either are utilizing that or can start to utilize that. Um, honestly, this we believe that God um, answers and responds to the prayers of his people. Like, we firmly believe that. And so we have this incredible opportunity and privilege to uh, pray for our family. That's what families do, right? Uh, and so we have that opportunity to pray for our church family and to, to allow others in our family to pray for us. So I hope that you guys will connect to that resource, use that resource, pray for some of the needs there, and let us know if there are ways that we can pray for you. Because um, that's, that's the way, one of the ways that we do the things that Jesus wants us to do as his people and as a little outpost of his kingdom here at CBC in Orange Park. So we just want to let you guys know about that and remind you of that opportunity and, uh, and privilege that we have. Uh, let me send us out with a benediction this morning. Worthy is the Lord our God to receive glory and honor and power, for he created all things, and by his will they existed and were created. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Go in the grace of the Lord.